Baby, come give me something, oh Baby, come give me something, oh Cause I can't stop loving Since I got a taste of your love Baby, come give me something Nine. We got Haas back in his hat. Remy, I think she's back at home. She might still be in Virginia. <clears throat> I'm still in Texas. But more importantly, we got Gene Banks and Derek Wigenberg on the show. This is going to be awesome, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think we're just going to hop right back into topic one. So we're talking Duke's Alex O'Connell. He's in the transfer portal. He played three seasons for the Blue Devils. He confirmed to 247 Sports that Maryland is suing him very heavily, and he's seriously thinking about it. So, Remy, you know these guys. You go to Duke. What do you take from this? Did you see him leaving? What do you think? I'm honestly shocked that he's leaving or would be leaving for his senior <laughs> year. I mean, especially with the kind of culture that Duke basketball prides himself on. I mean, they call themselves the Brotherhood. And just thinking from a sports perspective of my own, I don't think I could imagine leaving after playing with the same team for three years and especially trying to win a national championship as any team does. But, I mean, I understand if it's what he thinks is best for him, especially since Duke has the number one recruiting class coming in. You would have to assume that maybe some of that play time that he's longing for and that he wished he had this year is going to be eaten into for next year as well. Okay, Gene, let me ask you a question. Yeah. You know Alex. You know Alex O'Connell? I sure do. I've had several discussions with him. Okay, so what, what are your thoughts on him uh, moving on? And, Derek, we're going to come right behind him, Gene and talk to you about him possibly moving to Maryland, which is your home state. state. So, Gene, you're up. Go ahead. Well, one of the things I knew about him was that Duke needed a, a three-point shooter, to, and they've always had those. And he really showed promise in the very beginning of things. But then all of a sudden things change with new players coming in. you got to remember Duke's getting all these McDonald All-Americans coming in all the time. And a lot of them are very uh, – they can do a lot of things. Uh, the one thing Duke had somewhat lacked a little bit was that three-point shooting. was hoping that Alex would feel that. Uh, the thing about Alex's situation, he's got to get a little bit more stronger. You know, he's a, he's, a, he's a lightweight type of player. I mean, except I love him to death. He's a brotherhood type of thing. But he had to get a little bit stronger. Uh, his his three-point accuracy wasn't on point as what I think that they had hoped it would be. And I think that it started getting to a situation where where were he going to fit in with now with these recruiting classes, these players coming in, these one-and-dones are coming and going. Uh, I think it's best that he looked at it. And, and I have to give him praise in the fact that he had to look out for what's best for him. Um, and then to go with a team like Maryland, and uh, he may fit in there. It, it, it's a, where he's going to fit that's going to be better for him. And I think it will be good. But for him, for his future, he's going to have to get bigger. He's going to have to get, get stronger. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the things I think some of his weaknesses were, was his strength and being, being pushed around a little bit. Okay, Natalie, we're going to jump to you and give us your opinion. And, you know, you're a hometown girl, you're a Carolina rah rah. What do you think, if you were a Duke fan, what do you think of Alex O'Connell's move? I mean, Remy kind of mentioned, she knows him personally. I have some mutual friends with him. I don't know him personally. I'm a little surprised that after three seasons, he wants to make that move. But then again, if you look at his seasons at Duke so far, he got the least amount of minutes per game this season. And they have the best recruiting class coming in. So I kind of get wants to make the move. And I mean, he's played over 100 games at Duke. I think he's started a little over a dozen so he knows his role there, and, and I think that with all the talent coming in, he thinks he could have an expanded role elsewhere. And I've got no problem with that, and, and I hope that he goes to another program and he gets more time and he's, he's less of a role player. But I don't know if, if Maryland is the exact fit for him, but Derek, what do you think about Alex going to Maryland? How do you think he's going to fit in there? Well, it just it's first of all uh, – in, I've been in college basketball since 1986 as a coach and uh, times have changed and you make a decision going to college based on obviously you want to be around great teammates. Obviously you want a great academic institution, but one of the most important things is, is playing time and opportunity. And in three years, if you don't, you don't get the opportunity to play. Uh, he didn't want to go in his senior year not having the opportunity to play. And it's nothing against a great program like, like uh, Duke and Mike Krzyzewski, but it, it, and it has nothing to do with the income and competition. 
because everybody's going to a school, you know there's going to be competition. But sometimes it doesn't work out. In the last six years, there's been over 850 transfers in Division I basketball. 800, over 850 transfers. So what does that tell you? If I'm not, if I don't have an opportunity, if I'm not playing, I'm going to transfer. So I, like, I, I echo with Gene. I don't fault him for transferring. He had a great experience at Duke, but it was time for him to go to opportunity. And Maryland was a team this year that had the talent, was on a roll, tied for the Big Ten championship. They had a chance to go to the Final Four this year. This could have been a, a special year for University of Maryland. So I think he's making a good uh, decision. Uh, great area to, uh, to be in in the Washington, D.C. area. Great coach, great coaching staff in school. So uh, I wish the young man all the luck in the world, Gene. Gene, let me throw back to you. How good is this guy? You, I mean, you've seen him. You've seen him play. You've seen him in practice. How good is he? Very good. Very, very talented, very athletic. Uh, but you got to remember when, when, when R.J. and Zion were there, you know, they handled the ball pretty much a lot of times. Trey had the ball, Zion had it, RJ had it. So the only thing he could do is go to a certain spot. And when he had the opportunity to take those shots, when he did get him, it was almost like he had to make all of them. But uh, and, and, and I love him as a, as a guy, as a great guy. And, and, and again, what Whit was saying, is, as well as myself, this may be a good move for him. You know, Kay's going to get that new uh, group coming in. He gets, a, he gets a set of who he's going to play, how he's going to play them. You look at the way what Justin Robinson did. He played great in the last three or four games. That was amazing how he played. And he hadn't played all yes. year, the last three years. So this is would probably be a good thing. And, and Whit will tell you, him being coaching and so forth and so on, that sometime a guy has to make a certain move for the, for the betterment of himself. And it may be a great thing for Merlin. It would be a great interest story. So I, I, I give him thumbs up for, for the betterment of himself. Nothing against the Duke program or whatever. But they got guys coming in like a revolving door. So he looked at it and probably talked with his parents and everybody said, this is probably a good fit. But he's going to have to really train and get himself ready for this. So, Derek, let me ask you a question. Um, if uh, this is just like a carousel of players every single year tr transferring in and out of schools, do you think that players should be able to transfer in, in conference? And would Alex O'Connell be a fit at NC State? What are your thoughts on that without kind of being penalized? Yeah, not sure he would be a fit. That's that's a uh, Coach Keats question there. Uh, obviously, I've seen him. He, he's, I've seen him a little bit. He's, he's he has the talent. You can't you can't uh, be at Duke and not have any talent. So he obviously has the talent, and Maryland sees the talent as well. Um, the rule there's some rules on the docket right now. One number one. There may be a rule that not only you can transfer within the conference, but you may not be able to sit out. And here's the case in point. A regular student can transfer to uh, any school in the country and don't have to sit out. So why does athletes have to sit out? That's one, so That's one point. day you're going to see this, guys. We're going we're gonna to see this where you will be allowed not only transfer without sitting out, but you're going to be able to transfer within the conference without penalty. That's coming down the road. So just stay tuned to those new rules coming up. And, and Derek, I think you'd actually make the conference better because a guy who wants to, you know, goes to a program, doesn't fit in, but maybe he fits in at Wake Forest. Maybe he fits in somewhere else on Tobacco Road. Um, I think it would actually make more energy, more excitement in the conference. And to get that guy have an opportunity to express himself on the basketball court, I think that would add so much more energy to the conference. And I'm with you. They should be able to uh, transfer in conference. Gene, do you agree? Yeah, well, Hassan, you can look at LeBron, Chris Bosh, the Wade. You had those three. Now you got AD and LeBron. You know, guys – Think about college where these guys are talking to each other and saying, listen, I'm going to transfer, I'm going to transfer, I'll meet you in Maryland. Now you got three, three, two guys that came from one great program, another great program, and you got these three guys. It, like like Wood says, it's going to be a new culture, new trend once they allow that to happen. And they're going to have to make changes, especially with the, the paying of players. So there's going to be a lot of different stuff going on because the NCAA has been, uh, been battered and some of it rightfully so. 
uh, and they should have, the kids should have that opportunity to have a good uh, college experience. The great thing I loved about Man College, I was in college for four years, and people don't even know, they were asking me to come out my sophomore year, which was not a good year. But, uh, you know, those guys in the NBA were, were, were pros, but uh, I'm, 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 listen, I'm happy for them. You know, when these kids get an education, get an experience. Uh, he just, like I said, he's just going to really look at it. He made the decision, get himself ready. What is his forte? Three-point shots. When you get up on him, he can go and dunk on you. So it's all on him, and, and I wish him kudos for whatever he does. So I'm going to go ahead and move us into topic two, and I'm just going to let you guys both know this is Haas. His, it's his projected lineup. So this is my Haas lineup. Projected. Theoretic lineup for UNC next year. I want everybody's thoughts here. We can start with Remy, then go Derek, then go Gene. But this is what Haas says. R.J. Davis, Caleb Love, Leaky Black, Garrison Brooks, Walker Kessler, and the first off the bench is Armando Baycott. My only beef with this lineup is think Baycott is healthy. I don't see how he gets beat out of a starting spot. He'll be returning. In between injury, he had some strong performances. That's my only beef with it. But, Remy, what do you think? And we'll move down the line that way. Go Remy, then Derek, and then Gene. Natalie, I agree with you um, regarding Armando Baycott. But, honestly, I haven't focused too much on Carolina's recruiting class and what they have coming in. I've been focused on Dukes and how Dukes going to be better than Carolina once again. All right. Yes. Tough All challenge right. for us. It will be an interesting year. But, oh, I also want to interject with this. So if they didn't have a tournament this year, did we technically not make the tournament? Or is there just not a – like, I want to – like, what are you – what, how's that going down? <laughs> now, you, now, now you, are, you already know that they weren't going to make the tournament. So <laughs> very clear. But, Gene, we didn't have a selection Sunday. So how can – we didn't make the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen. I I love Roy. I'm gonna tell you. I, I I every time I see Roy, we have a great time talking, and I love the program. The one thing I like about the Big Four, I call it the Big Four: <coughs> Duke, State, Wake Forest, and us. Once we get those programs, the states states back to <coughs> rise again. Uh, Carolina's going through what they're going, but they're still strong. We got to get Wake back in that thing. But uh, I've always I've always had a big passion for the Big Four. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And quiet as kept with, I almost went to NC State because my mother loved Norm Sloan. So <laughs> I'll put that out there for that. But, um, yeah, we got to, you know, the Carolina situation, they could, they're getting these players in. But one thing I'm, I'm missing with these coaches and everybody is that they're not getting those backward rebound guys. They're getting all Americans, these McDonald's. You got to fit in, like you say, chemistry. And Whit will tell you this about the, him being coaching. You don't have to always have the top, top McDonald's player. You got that gritty guy, like what we had with Kenny Denard. You know, Kenny Denard came from Kings. He wasn't a big top player, but he fit in. And you got to get those kind of players that are just uh, can fit in and, and, and be a part of chemistry and, and just eat glass and, and play those roles. Got it. Got so, it, Derek. What do you think? Yeah, you and Derek, you are a coach. So tell us what it needs to be repaired on this Carolina side. How do you come First back? All, First of all, all the Carolina fans, just calm down. Roy <laughs> Williams is in the Hall of Fame. He's got three national championships. It's his first season, non-winning season. Just calm down. The program's right. going to be fine. So don't worry about it. I mean, this was a t every coach has had a tough year, right? And this just sure. chemistry, a lot of injuries. They had a tough year. It, every coach is going to go through this. So – you don't have to worry about Roy Williams in Carolina. They'll be back. They'll be a good team next year. Um, but it's all about chemistry, and Gene touched on it. I mean, you can put a lot of great players and talented guys together, but they got to be able to work together, play together. And to your point, Gene, sometimes it's only one year. Like Cole Anthony, he's done. So Cole yep. Anthony played one year. If Cole Anthony stayed, they would really be a terrific team. But – now you got guys from Duke and Carolina. They're, they're leaving after one year. So now it's hard. You, it's almost like you have a brand-new team every, every year. So next year, Carolina will have a brand-new team. you got five new guys coming in. you got a couple of guys that's leaving. Some of the guys, they're going to have to figure it out again and see 
what the chemistry is like, uh, who's going to who's going to accept their roles, who's going to who's going to be the shooters, who's going to score. I mean, they just going to have to figure it out against, and every team is going to have to figure it out. Chemistry is so big now, uh, just with all the new, because basically with all these grant transfers and one and dones and people transferring, you basically going to have to mold a brand new team every year. And with and with you as a coach, you know how this situation is as, as well. You don't have a lot of time when they come in to get them to get them to the program. You know, September, August, they come in the summer, August, September. Then before you know it, boom, you're right there. And you got to put together a team that's got to go out there and compete on a high level. That's where Carolina is. That's where Duke is. You're at that high level right off the bat. So, you know, it, 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 it takes some time. And you don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I thought NC State, our team this year, Coach Keats is doing a heck of a job, and I think we were getting some momentum uh, going into the tournament, and I think we had an opportunity. We was going to play Duke if they didn't cancel the tournament, and I think we had an opportunity. To, uh, Duke was a good matchup for us. And, for sure. Uh, we had had success. We had uh, uh, had a big win at home, and uh, we, we lost to them on the road. But we felt good, and Coach Keats and the team felt good going into the ACC tournament. And probably if we'd have won that game against Duke, we probably would have been in the tournament. And uh, we're sorry we missed that opportunity to get in the tournament because I think our team was playing well and getting better, and they finally accepted their roles, and and uh, we we were coming to our own. I mean, this year anybody could have won the national championship. Yes, exactly. Any of thirty exactly. something teams, it was exactly. wide open this year. There was no great teams out there. It was just a team that was going to get hot. It could have been us. It could have been Duke. It could have been anybody. It could have been University of Maryland. could have been Kentucky. I mean, there's a lot of teams that had a chance to really get to the Final Four this year. That's, what, that's the unfortunate thing. And the mid-majors are not scared of none of the big teams anymore. They, they come no. at you. They come no, at you no, hard. Definitely not. No, no, definitely, definitely not. I mean, uh, you know, if you looked around the country, there was a lot of teams for the first time that that's, was, was in the mix. I mean, Utah State. Who would have known Utah State? Utah yeah. State was 120-somewhere. They was a terrific team. I mean, San Diego State. There was a lot of teams out there that yes, really sir. had an opportunity uh, to do something special. And everybody fits me up. Mark Few, Mark Few, what he's doing out there in Gonzaga is unbelievable. Yep, consistency. I mean, Gonzaga, it might have been this year this year. So, you, know, you never know. Uh, that's the unfortunate thing. But, Gene, we're forgetting one important thing that these kids, um, the, the opportunity, going back to the opportunity to play, is that you only get one chance at this to get it right. And some of you, if you don't play in your four years or your five-year period in which to play, you don't get the chance to play the sport because everybody's not going to the pros. That's right. Everybody's not playing in Europe. So you got to get this right because – you better get your education, and you better get it right because this may be your last hurrah. Amen. And so th th it's important for these kids to realize that you better go to a school where you have opportunity to play right away. All right, all right. Natalie. We're moving on, guys. I know I couldn't agree with you more. Derek, I like what you said, too, because I think an underrated part of college basketball this year was the insane amount of parity. I mean, we were talking about it, too. Duke already got upset a couple times this year. SFA was one of them. To where going into the tournament, I kind of felt like they had some of their upsets out of the way. They could have made a run, but you're right. I mean, so many programs that they could have made it all the way down to the nitty-gritty. But we're now going to look at Duke's starting lineup for next year. So, Gene, I have a feeling you might also want to chime in on this too. But this is, again, Hassan's lineup he has. But he has I, I, Jeremy uh, Root, Cassius <laughs> Stanley, Jalen Delmore, <laughs> Johnson, Mark Williams, and the first off the bench is DJ Stewart. So what do we think? What do you think? I'll start with you. How, what do you think of Hassan's lineup? Give him a grade if you want. Critique him if you want. Throw some in. What's going to be the key for Duke? How's it going to change? I think there's going to be a wild card that's going to be in there. Besides, because you got so many players that's, that's coming in, and a lot of them are very uh, like the same type of abilities. You know, Wendell Moore and those guys. They, they you know, and, and they, they're going to still be there. There's going to be some competing for some spots. You know, um, and somebody's going to be left out in that. And so that's why you look at the situation with uh, O'Connell leaving. 
it might be a good choice him leaving because there's going to be a lot of competition. And K K narrows it down to he, he used to narrow down to eight, seven, eight guys. This year he played like ten or eleven. But uh, twelve. It's gonna be, Jay, can uh, I read them off to you? That I think it's twelve guys. Yeah, I think. Yeah. It's I think it's twelve guys. It's Jeremy Roach, Cassius Stanley, Jalen, um, uh, Jalen, Wendell Moore, uh, Johnson, Mark Williams. First off the bench is DJ Stewart, Joey Baker, Matthew Hurt, Jordan Goldwire, Henry Coleman, and J-Man Breakfield. I mean. Where are they going to find the minutes? Remy, what do you think? I mean, I was going to ask you, like, what leaves Jordan Goldwire and Matthew Hurt out after they played big minutes this year and started half their games? Well, okay. Yeah, but that's – that. You, you saw what happened with situations, but Goldwire had to work himself back into it. it, it it's – I'm going to tell you, that's that's a practice you're going – everybody needs to look at. That's going to be one to see that battle because that's going to be like 11, 12 guys trying to get that eight – it's like eight spots basically locked in, but you never know, K may have to change his philosophy. He does make adjustments where he's going to have to go eight or maybe 10 because he's got all these all Americans and they don't want to play. Somebody's not going to be very, very happy. I'm going to tell you that, right? At least two players. I'm also curious where the leadership is going to come in, especially with Alex O'Connell. If him leaving, it really just leaves Goldwire as a sole senior besides Mike Buckmeyer. Yep. yep. So, and, Trey, and Trey's gone. See, Trey Trey's was that big leader. Him. That's going and to be a big know. piece. The thing is, I want to know, too, I was looking at the leadership as well, but also in my mind, if you have these these guys that have built up their minutes, they've been reliable for the team, some of the rock and the foundation of the team, and then you have these new guys coming in that are ready to compete. Derek, how as a coach do you handle seniority and leader and leading the team versus new talent and people in it and trying to be fair but also seniors? What does it come down to in that decision? Well, it comes down to players determine who play. And if you're a senior and you're a veteran player and you let a rookie come in there and beat you out, you have been beat out. I mean, I played against, I mean, when I was a senior, Ernie Myers was an All-American from the Bronx, great player from high school, but there's no way in the world that Ernie Myers is going to beat me out for a spot. So <laughs> to me – there's competent that's always, I said it earlier, if you at this level of basketball, there's players already there. There's always competition. You have to come in and beat somebody out every kid every year. So <laughs> the players will determine who's going to play, and the cream rises to the top. Always. So the best players Love are going to emerge. You Coaches, you don't have to worry about it. The only thing you would have to consider is that if it's close, do you go with the experience a little bit more? So Coach K, he's won over a thousand some games. He's a Hall of Famer. Uh, trust me, he will figure it out. Uh, his teams have changed every year. He used to have a defensive oriented team. Mm -hmm. He's lately been an offensive de uh, a team. Uh, this year, he he stepped up and played a little bit more full court pressure. Mm -hmm. He's played a little zone. He's made the ad adjustments. And so if he feels though that's 10 deserving players that's playing hard and it's hard to determine, he will figure out a way to play 10 guys. That's just the nature of a good coach. So I don't see that's being a problem as much as it's, it's, it's a great positive. Because if you've got 10 or 12 great players, you let them know from – hey, listen, guys, 10 guys going to play. If you're in the top 10, this is what the situation is. And, and everybody's got to live with that. Yep. So then, Gene, do you think all these guys can manage to get minutes in the Duke system? Do you think that's, that's plausible? That's something that could happen? Honestly and truly, I think, Honestly, I think, I, I think he's going to go eight, maybe if he goes deep nine. Um, you know, like like, like Witt says, he, he's coached, he's played – you know, we used to go when we go to different courts. When you get out there with some of the best players, you win, you stay on the court. So whoever's going to be out there balling, that's who's going to be out there. That's going to be playing, and some guys are going to get moves. And, and then, you know, you got some guys coming into a new territory. Where their heart is at, where their gut is at, how they prepare it. Some well, guys who are good will be able to step back. You know, they'll, they'll let the other pe people lead it or whatever case. But that's why the veterans, like Witt said, 
The vets will say, listen, this is, I, I've been here. I'm, I'm going to run this. Or a young guy coming in confident says, no, I want that. The battles are going to be something else, but they're going to really determine early wh which way it goes. And everybody has to stay ready because something can happen. It could be an injury. Something comes up. So before you know it, like Carolina this year, they had about three or four injuries. And then guys had to step up and come and play. You don't know. I'm going to tell you who's been doing a great job, and he doesn't get enough credit, and he plays 10 to 11 players every year. Leonard Hamilton from Florida State. Yes. yes. If you look at his teams for the last five or six years, he's had 10 to 11 players he's played. He's the third winner in his coach behind Coach K and Roy. And, no, and he, matter of fact, he won the regular season, and he's the ACC champ this year. They're yes. not giving Leonard Hamilton enough credit. He plays 10 to 11 guys, and all his guys appear, appear to be very happy. Just because they're playing. They all want to play 25 minutes. But if you can play 10 or 11 guys like Leonard Hamilton has, you can, you can still have success. And Florida State was another team that had an opportunity to make a run of the Big five dark four as well this year. I, I couldn't agree more. Well, we're going to wrap on topic two. We're going to hit a break, and then we're going to come back in and continue everything with topic three. It's almost game time. Don't forget to pick up a six-pack or four-pack of the Blue Blood Rivalry Ale. Go to your local supermarket if they do not have it, go to your manager and ask for it. The official game day beer, the Blue Blood Rivalry Ale, is light, crisp, and refreshing. All right, we're back. Season 2, Episode 9. It's the usual gang with our special guests, Gene Banks and Derek Wittenberg. We're on to Topic 3. So, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar laughs at Michael Jordan being named the greatest college basketball player. Gene, I know you feel strongly about this topic, so I'm going to just go ahead and let you lead us off. What do you think? Well, Kareem has the right to laugh because Kareem played a lot of good years, and he's never even in the conversation of being the greatest of all time. He has to be in that conversation. But let's break it down. I'll make it very clear. Michael Jordan is definitely one or two. You know, he changed the game. You, you got Magic. You got Bird. But here's the thing. When you – Stephen A. Smith and all these other guys have these talks and all this, who's the greatest. They got KD and they got LeBron. The greatest player that ever played the game was Wilt Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. Hands down, not just the points, but everything else, just defense, everything else. But you, they don't even put in the conversation – with Bill Russell, who Bill Russell won, what, 10, all 11 the championships. All the, rings. all the rings. He was a leader. He, he, I mean, he had to go against Will constantly. Then you forget about Oscar Robinson. You know, they don't even talk about him in the conversation. Then you got Trickle Down and Pete Maravich. You know, Pistol Pete was amazing. You know, he scored like 40-something points in college, and he was great. So when you go there, but, but then again with Kareem. How do you not put Kareem in that top three? That's a tough, tough thing to deal with. it. And they didn't even talk about Kobe at all about being in the top three or four or five when Kobe destroyed the league as well. So my big – We're my talking grade, about I college think, basketball specifically, though. Oh, you oh, just college basketball? Just college basketball. That's the context of well, the how, conversation. But how can you say – how can you give Michael the nod as being the greatest that's in college? The, so that's the conversation. He just won – College, best college name, greatest college basketball player, and that's why Kareem laughed. Derek, tell me what you think, man. That's called a popularity. Exactly. Poll. That's you. all that is. <laughs> Thank you. Half of the kids in America is wearing Jordan shoes, and he got all the votes from there. Listen, if you're going to go to a popular contest, you haven't been mentioned. If you talk about college, what about David Thompson? Yes, sir. If you talk about yes, college, I was about what about to get to Ralph that. Sampson? If yes. you're talking about college. So college. That's what we're talking greatness, about. Greatness, greatness is a body of work. We're talking about years. David Thompson could not play as a freshman. If David Thompson would have played as a freshman, he might have 5,000 points, and he didn't even have a three-point line. Nope. So when you look at all of the 
all these great players. Bill Russell won two championships. You know, Kareem. You know, Bill Walton had a fantastic uh, college career. He might not be in that top five, but he's in the college conversation. So when you're talking about greatness and who's the best in college, you got to look at a body of work. You got to look at did they win a championship? What's their numbers? How important they are to their basketball team? And all those individuals were very, very important to their team. If you take them away, that individual team, and put them on another team, will that team continue to win? And, and I think and that's you, you got to determine. You can't just say it, okay. that's everybody's opinion. Remy, that Michael Jordan. You there? Listen, yeah. I outscored Michael Jordan in college. So the, the, am I in the conversation? <laughs> I should be in the conversation. You need to be. You need I to agree. Be. I agree. Yeah, so so Michael had a – and Michael only played in college for three years. He only played three years. Freshman year, he makes the shot. Second year, he comes into his own. Third year, he's terrific. And then he leaves. So you're going to say the best player in the history of college only played three years? He's, oh, he's the best? Uh, no, 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 I don't agree with that. Can we can we read off of some of uh, Kareem Abdul's awards? Remy, can you read off uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar's awards in college? He won three NCAA tournaments, right? As wow. part of the greatest dynasty. That's three. Basketball. Jordan won one. Okay. Five, four most outstanding player three times. Wow. Okay, what else, Remy? National Player of the Year honors. Well, I just said three times, and was a three-time consensus All-American. And he's also outproduced Jordan in nearly every meaningful scoring metric in their respective college careers. See, I was I'm, point of respect. I'm, la I'm laughing with Kareem. I'm laughing with Kareem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I respect Jordan, and I'm a Tar Heel, but everyone is just so quick to my – Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, he's the greatest at this, this, and and he he was definitely one of the greatest. But I think that both of you are right. There's not enough people in the conversation, and people tend to just harp on the names that you hear most. Well, it has to be Le LeBron now. He's the most. He's done this. He's done that. But everyone is so quick to know it was just Jordan. But I think you're right. I think he was right to laugh too. I mean, what do you think, Haas? Get in on this. I, I think personally, for me. I think Kareem was probably the best college basketball player. And, and, and Derek, I know you might say something different, but, I mean, he was part of the Wooden Dynasty. We're talking, about, we're talking about college, right? College. Okay. Okay, we but, go. we're, okay. but we're going to go to the pros, Gene. I got one question yeah. on the pros, but it's a bit, little bit later. But, that, but, but that, that, the thing I was saying that I'm taking Wilt out of that college. He only did the one year at Kansas. Yeah, and we're going to have a great Wilt story. Like, for college basketball – I think Kareem, he won three national championships. Amen. Amen. Three Amen. times player of the year. And he's arguably a top 10 uh, all-time NBA player. Oh. I think Kareem's top body ten. work. Top 10. Top, maybe top five. I, I mean, top five. <laughs> okay. I believe that Kareem's body of work was the best body of work ever in college basketball. And I think his skyhook was so signature that um, he had a shot at 7'2". He was every bit 7'2". He had a shot that, you know, was pretty much unblockable. I mean, what do you think, Derek? Well, it's, it's – I mean, let the number speak for itself, okay? If you take the number – this is not a popularity contest. This is about <laughs> the numbers. Numbers okay? don't lie. Not numbers who we like. Lie. Not, not who, whose shoes I'm wearing. It's about the numbers, okay? So I'm laughing with Kareem. <laughs> I'm laughing with Kareem. <laughs> Kareem has the right to laugh. Now, now we're not taking nothing away from Michael. He had an outstanding. But, Michael, if you look at a the body of work in the three years as compared to Ralph Sampson, David Thompson, yep. if we keep putting out names. If we look at the body of work, Michael Jordan, in terms of numbers, is not going to be. What a minute. What about Car uh, 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 Elijah Wan from Houston? How about his numbers? What yeah. about Christian? What, what about Christian Leitner? Christian Leitner's Chris, numbers. Christian I mean, Leitner's in that conversation for best yep. college basketball player. Yep. I mean, it's you got a lot of basketball. guys you can throw in the mix. It's crazy. All right, so let's let's move it forward. Let's talk about the NBA. 
Um, LeBron James is statistically better than Michael Jordan in just about every single metric. Um, but Michael Jordan, your a Tar Heel, is considered the best basketball player. Gene, Derek, whoever wants to start, where? how do you compare those two, or can you compare them? Uh, go ahead, Whit. I, I, I've heard these conversations over and over again. They're two different type players, two different styles, whatever. It Michael played during an era where basketball, it was just – he, he, he engulfed the whole nation, which is what LeBron is doing now. Um, I, I, I still have Michael over LeBron. You know, LeBron's the king. Give him that title, but you're talking about the greatest of all time. I, I, I still give uh, Michael the nod over him. The six titles as well goes hand in hand. His defensive and offense with LeBron is doing as well offensively and defensively. But, uh, you know, I'm still so listen. Will's the best. Will's the best. Give Kareem it. Give give it to Kareem as well in there, and then Michael. Uh, you know, it's 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 crazy. There, there was a certain culture, certain era. There was no three point shot. There was a, there was no shot clock, and uh, all that stuff. So the, the eras and things change and so forth. More teams, the whole nine yards. So, eh, you know, give Will, Will, Bill, Kareem, and Michael. That's. That's it. I'm done. I'm done, man. I'm done. You're, you're done. Well, well, drop the mic. well here, here's what's interesting about the comparison of Michael Jordan and LeBron James. First of all, LeBron James did not go to college. Okay? So he came in to the game in NBA straight from high school. So for him, yep. he had to learn right from the jump and get right into the fire right away. Jordan had three years to kind of hone in his skills. So there is a different comparison right there, starting off with that. Now you get to the pros. Michael didn't have to do as much as LeBron exactly. James has to do now. LeBron James is the first guy, athletic guy. Magic was the first big point guard. But LeBron James – took the point guard, the point forward to another level. He brought the ball up. He, he got everybody involved. He could score. He rebounded. He blocked shot. He had to do all that for the teams that he played on. Michael probably could, could, have do, could do the same, but he didn't have to do that because that wasn't required back then. Now we have 6'9 to 6'10 guys that can bring the ball up the court. They can stop the offense. There's no big man play no more, Gene. There's no big man play. So Not everybody has five guys out. And LeBron James has shown the world, like, this is a 6'8", six, six, great athlete that can pass it, shoot it, defend anybody, can play multiple positions. We haven't seen a guy like him since Oscar Robinson. True. Who I uh, remember. So, like, he is the modern day Oscar Robson at 6'9, that can jump out of the moon, that can make deep three point shots. He's a freak of nature. So, Great I comparison. see that Great a comparison. hard comparison to make because LeBron had the opportunity to show all his skills. Michael only, now, Michael could do whatever he wants. So, but he didn't have to do all that he's doing. He played in a triangle offense. The offense that they play now is called a LeBron James offense. <laughs> LeBron James says, this is what we're going to do. And this is what they do. So, LeBron James is not only the point guard, but he's running the whole team and probably the whole franchise. Plus, Whit, you got you to remember, too, Whit, when Mike was playing, the physicality of the game was totally different than what it's now. You know, yes. They, it's a total different situation. You can't even touch guys now. But yeah, back right. then, and I played with him. I was on the court with him when he had the 63. I was on the court with him against the Pistons. Those games were brutal. I'm talking yes. about physicality, the hand checking, going in, taking you out. So and if he goes to the basket, didn't y'all put him on the ground? Yes, sir. If he comes to the basket, didn't you put him on the ground? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, we had, me and Oakley had to defend him a lot of times when we played the Pistons. That's, that was every game. You know, they, they changed the dynamics. They down 10. And and you know what's coming, you know Lambert's gonna deck him. They going they going and it's a fight's gonna break out. So 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 <laughs> Hassan, tell, let's the Hassan and the ladies, let's let's do this. In order to make these comparisons, 
you have to go back in time and watch film and now you can make the comparison because what happens to our younger people is yeah. that they don't go back in history For and sure. look at a lot of you did you see michael jordan play you didn't see Michael Jordan play, so it's hard for you. You've seen LeBron James play, so you have not seen Michael Jordan. So you have to get on YouTube and see Michael Jordan and look at his, what he way way he played, and look at LeBron James. Look at the numbers, and then you can make a you can make an educated guess on who you would think that yeah. may be the best instead of popularity content. Now you at Carolina. You're going to automatically say Michael Jordan's best. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah, you're That's just what I'm going to do. I was, you know, without any fact, you're just going to say Michael Jordan's the best. I did not get to to watch Michael Jordan in the NBA, obviously. I'm too young. See? But him later on, and, and I will say that I have my own, you know, angst against LeBron. I won't beat my Spurs when he was with the Heat. I saw it a couple times, actually, but – I don't know. I think you're right. And what gets me is it's a different time. If there are different rules and different standards of play, yep. how how transcend a different game? I mean, same game, but it's not the same format. So I think it's so hard to make that comparison. I almost weren't always somebody number one because what if someone could be the best in that time frame and that NBA and, and this new NBA and how things are evolving. But you know, it is what it is. We always want to make a number one, and, and I think you're right. I don't know if I could even answer that because I think that that's just so hard to say. It. And trying to get a number one and having those two, you leave out so many other great players. Bill has all the records. Bill has all the rings. So I don't know. I mean, it's crazy. Bill, Larry Bird, you know, wow. Bernard King. I mean, geez, the Iceman. I mean, it's just a lot of players that were just exceptional in their time, especially during that, that physicality era where now – you got guys doing – guys now, they can shoot. I mean, almost every player can shoot from way outside now. Like you said, Whit said it, and it's true. There's no big man's game now anymore like it used to be. All the big men are outside. Even Embiid shooting three-pointers all over the place when, when he can be destroying everything inside. So the culture has changed dramatically. What about the late, great Moses Malone? He was yes, a, sir. He had an outstanding career uh, in, in the NBA, a big man that – it wasn't many that averaged 20 points and 20-some rebounds. There wasn't many people that do that as well. So this is a good conversation. When you talk about greatness, you know, we had a speaker come in, and he said, do you want to be great? I said, man, when you say the word great, you better back it up with something because the yes, word sir. great is a body of work. You just can't say I want to be great. You have to experience greatness. And you had, and greatness comes with a body of work. All right. Well, guys, I think um, that wraps up the show. First off, Jack, Gene, we want to just thank you. Me, Natalie, and Remy want to just thank you guys for coming on the show. And um, as we say here, we out. We out. Thank you, guys. We out. Baby, come give me something on. God damn, you know who I am Tried to be on the low, but you ain't slow Keep my shirt open, eyes low Get a lot of paper, I know, but you ain't